Hello, welcome to Foreign Entanglements. I'm Matt Duss. Uh, I'm a policy analyst at the Center for American Progress. Uh, joining me today is Ben Birnbaum, a reporter in uh, foreign affairs, national security for the Washington Times. How are you doing, Ben? I'm good. Uh, so we are going to talk, uh, as we often do on, on this program, about Iran and some other Middle East issues. We'll get to Iraq and uh, a piece that, that Ben wrote a couple weeks ago. Uh, but first, let's let's touch on some of the news from Iran this morning. Ben, what do you hear? Um, well, we know that these talks uh, with the P5 plus one are going to get started, I believe, um, it's April. I forget the exact day. April 13th, uh, I think. April 13th, with a location to be determined, as I understand. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think the big news there is that any sort of military strike has probably been put off at least, um, at least for several months, because as long as there's any pretense of negotiations, mm -hmm. uh, the Israelis are not going to feel it in their interest to strike. Right. There was also an article this morning in Haaretz um, uh, saying that Ehud Barak, because of a number of reasons, one of them being this, this, this leaked CENTCOM war game uh, mm -hmm. a few weeks ago in the New York Times um, that right. was seen as a pretty, a pretty obvious message from the U.S. defense establishment or the U.S. government to say, you know, hold off on this. He has mm -hmm. this, this Haaretz article was surmising that the Israelis will not strike now until, if they do, until 2013. So I think that's yeah, I, what I, you were just saying. Um, I, I read that. I, I agree with the conclusion, though not with uh, his reasoning. I, I don't mm -hmm. know how, how he got from A to B. Uh, yeah. I think that it's more likely than not that they will wait until 2013 um, for a few reasons. I mean, if you are Bibi Netanyahu and you are looking at the U.S. presidential election, on the one hand, you might have an incentive to strike now um, because you know you would have complete support from the president. He has specifically asked you to wait until after the election. You're not going to want to alienate him. Um, and also, if there's a chance that Mitt Romney could win and Mitt Romney has basically committed himself to U.S. military action, which is obviously Israel's first choice in the matter, then, you know, either way, if it looks like Romney's going to win, he has an incentive to wait. If it looks like Obama's going to win, he has an incentive to wait. Uh, but so that being said, yeah, go on. Yeah, let's just jump back to something you, you said earlier, mm -hmm. uh, just a few seconds ago, is that if BB strikes before November, Obama will have to support it because he'll have no choice. Now, just, just draw that out a little bit. I mean, why is that? Uh, it just because in the heat of a, an election, I mean, he's already been uh, tagged uh, unfairly, I think, as being anti-Israel. Mm -hmm. And there's no way he's going to alienate, not, not just Jewish voters, but I mean, I think voters in general. I think a strike on Iran by Israel would probably have overwhelming support, at least in the U.S., I, mm -hmm. certainly not in Europe. Um, but I just I expect that he would not give anything but... Right. I mean, I, I agree with that. Um I think it's worth talking through a little bit. I mean, we've got, you know, one of the kind of themes of these of this debate that we've been having over the past year, two years about Israeli or, or U.S. strikes is, is, is so, you know, obviously it's a level of risk not to, to, to wait, but there's an, an extreme level of risk to a strike as well. I think we've had numerous reports, numerous war games that have come to very, very similar conclusions in regard to... The, the consequences of a strike uh, for, for U.S. troops, for U.S. interests, for U.S. relationships. Um, I, and I would call it a fairly strong consensus that, you know, there's some very, very likely negative consequences, and that's a reason to wait. Um, but yet, the political reality is such that, um, you know, separating out the kind of analytical defense establishment, foreign policy establishment take on this versus the political take on this, which is that, the U.S. would have to jump in and support uh, if the Israelis decided to strike. I mean, it seems like there's a tension there between what we've defined as our interests and what we might have to do because of political imperatives. Well, I, I, I think, you know, there is also the issue of timing, and but the Israelis mm -hmm. see their window for action rapidly closing. I mean, I've heard people say that they think, it, you know, by the time, by after the election, it will be too late for them. Mm -hmm. And they've been pressing the administration to give a commitment mm -hmm. that if they wait and their um, window for action closes, that if everything else mm -hmm. fails, the administration, that 
Obama will strike. And I, I don't think they've gotten that commitment. Yeah. Um, some sort of progress in, in these talks coming up, um, I think Israel will strike sooner or later. I, I, if I had to right. guess, it would probably be um, you know, er, early 2013. Um, but then again, uh, there's also the issue of weather. And um, as I've been told, and I don't quite understand this, but I know they need to have clear skies for a certain amount of time. They need to have a guarantee of clear skies for a certain number of days. And that window, as I understand it, closes in October and doesn't open up again until sometime in the spring. And by that time, it might be too late for them. So, um, I'm curious. One of my bugaboos, uh, or, or I guess some might call it obsessions, or just, you know, or something I'm, I'm known to be very, anno very annoying about, let's say, is this distinction be between preventive and preemptive. And I'm just kind of curious for your take on this. I mean, I often see those terms used interchangeably when, in fact, they mean very different things um, and have m much different sort of legal, they're grounded in much different legal standards. Uh, you know, there's a recognition um, in international law generally that if, if your enemy is clearly massing to attack or taking steps that would, you know, obviously directly lead them to attacking you. Right. There, you know, as 1967 war is is the you know the most obvious example, um, then preemptive action means you attack them first. But preventive means something different. I mean, preventive war was you know the kind of promulgated in the Indy Bush doctrine. The attack on Iraq, the invasion of Iraq, was was a preventive action. It was not that Saddam was preparing to attack us. It was just that you know it was argued that sometime in the future. He could give WMD to terrorists, etc. I mean, it seems that an attack on Iran would clearly be in the latter category, a preventive attack. Um, you know, just prevent. You know, Iran may not be preparing to put a nuke on a missile. Well, in fact, even if if and when they do obtain a nuke in in the you know years from now, um, mm -hmm. if they were putting that nuke on top of a missile, that might be one thing. But just kind of doing what they're doing now does not rise to the level of... of uh, I agree at the level of language attack, that or at least calling it would be a that. preventive you agree? attack. I, I think the Israelis would argue that since they and their targets have been attacked by Iran or, or Iranian proxies you know, for, for years, that you know, if anything, it, it would be a response. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, you know, at the level of justification, I, I certainly think right. that there is a consensus... Uh, in Israel, that regardless of when, whether they should strike now or later, or with U.S. backing or without U.S. backing, I, I think you'll find very few people uh, mm -hmm. who argue that Israel can or should live under an mm -hmm. Iranian nuclear shadow. Right. I think you'll see some of those people in um, in the Israeli discourse. I think we've we've talked before about people like uh, Ephraim Halevi, the former Mossad chief. And I don't know that he's come out and argued in favor of containment, but he has repeatedly stressed that, you know, talked, you know, kind of pushed back against hysteria, as he calls it, this idea that you, the idea of an existential threat. Um, have you, do you know what I'm talking about? Do you, have you read his comments? Um, I, 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 I've read some of his comments. Um, obviously, I've seen yeah. we had Mayor Dagan mm -hmm. give his interview to 60 Minutes. Um, but I, I think the debate within Israel, within the Israeli government and um, security community, is more over the how and the when of a strike um, than on the weather. Yeah. Uh, I don't think you'll find many people who yeah. will argue for containment. Um, I, I just I don't see how it works in in the Israeli Iranian case. You, you don't have a nuclear hotline between right. Tehran and Jerusalem. And I think given how volatile the region is, I, it would be very easy to see many nuclear crises and, and potentially one spitting out of control. And if you don't have that hotline, it's easy to see how. I mean, people would like to say that you know, mutually assured destruction assures that there will be no mm. exchange. I'm not sure I buy that. Um, I think you could, you know, you could see some miscalculation or some misperception spin out of control. And, and I, I do think that the chances are zero, that there would be some... No, absolutely not. I, in fact, I think that is the biggest danger um, of a, a nuclear weaponized, you know, in Iran with a nuclear weapon. Um, 
yeah, clearly, I don't buy the idea that they would give it to Hezbollah or some other terrorist group after having committed, you know, after having invested so much, you know, financially, economically, politically, and borne all kinds of international opprobrium to do so. I, I doubt that, you know, having done that, they would then hand it over to some terrorist proxy. I think the, you know, the kind of first strike is, is unlikely. I think they want it for mainly for regime, regime preservation and their own deterrence. But yes, I think once you get into a situation like that, right. the idea of whether, you know, some kind of accident in the Strait of Hormuz, some other escalation on Iran's or uh, Israel's border, whether with Hamas or with or with uh, Hezbollah, it could could spiral out of control. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think that's that's um, that's a concern. I do. I think I there was a piece written um, by um, last name is Furon a few a couple months ago, I think, though, that looked at some of the data on this. And, and found that pretty, the, you know, the, the data of the behavior of states once they got, you know, nuclear, states with nuclear weapons, once they got that nuclear weapon, tended overwhelmingly to engage in, in more risk-averse behavior. Now, I mean, that in itself is not a reason to kind of completely chill out. You know, Iran may very well be the outlier on this, but I thought that was very interesting, just in, in, in terms of, you know, looking at other states who've been in similar situations, did, you know, I think it goes to this idea that Iran, under with its nuclear, with a nuclear umbrella, would be much more destabilizing, would be much more adventurous, would be much more reckless. Um, that may be, but the the actual data that we have about nuclear weapon states is that they they become less reckless. I mean, the, the problem is is that our data on states with nuclear weapons in the history is is really quite limited, and so mm -hmm. I think you right. know, the entire idea that Matt is. It works, and it's a great idea. You know, it's only because mm -hmm. we've had, you know, what, 60 years of, of history with a few states, right. and nothing's happened. Right. But, you know, we've come very close. And I think we'd be having a right. very different discussion today about Israel and Iran had the Cuban Missile Crisis played out just a little differently. So I, I'm, I'm very wary of, of overlearning, um, you know, the, the uh, lessons of history here, because right. it, it is a different case. The players are different. You have different variables that you didn't have in other cases. And, um, you know, I, I do think that even though mm -hmm. the risks of a strike are great, so are the risks of a nuclear Iran. And I certainly think that's how Israelis view it. And I, I think they view the trade-off as between, you know, a, 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 a taking off a Band-Aid and, and having, you know, a few weeks or even a few months of hell and having sort of a drip-drip um, water torture over the next 10, 15 years. Hmm. Right. I, I totally I sympathize with that. And I also agree that it's important not to, you know, whether it's we call it overlearning the lessons of history or simply romanticizing the Cold War as this era of, of great power stability. I mean, you mentioned the Cuban Missile Crisis. There are other examples, too. That's the best known. But, you know, it wasn't as if, you know, these two powers with these all these hundreds of missiles pointed at each other was a moment of, of, of great. You know, there were it was essentially living on a knife's edge. Yeah. For decade after decade, um, and it's not a state of affairs that we should hope to recreate ever. Um, but again, it really comes back to the level of, the level of risk we, we're willing to to to, to accept. Um, and as you said, whether it, the risks of striking now and dealing with the consequences are better in a number of you know for whatever reason than dealing with the risks over a number of years. So, the the yeah, question is a very very tough call. Uh, the question is what would we expect to happen? I mean, I think there's a lot of loose talk of World War Three and and sort of what the Iranian response would be. And I think there's certainly a range of outcomes here, and, and it could be um, everything from Iran sort of offering token retaliation and, and playing the victim in the international community. And you know something a more mm -hmm. full-throated response that somehow draws in the U.S. Um, what's your sense of how they would respond? You know, given they have they have a tendency to kind of alienate potential partners. Uh, they have a tendency sometimes to just do things that don't make sense, and I think that's what's dangerous. Uh, in my view, the smartest possible thing that they can do would just be, as you just said, play the victim. Right. Um, you know, maybe some nominal strikes here and there, um, a, a few rockets, not to say that that's nothing, but, you know, kind of a nominal 
response just to show that we can strike, we have this depth if we, if we want it, but at the same time use, kind of ride the international outrage that w I think would very, very likely follow such a strike to withdraw from the NBT, kick the inspectors out, and go full bore um, toward, toward that weapon. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the argument I've heard is that uh, they would certainly want to offer retaliation against Israel, but would probably stop short of doing anything that would draw in the U.S. just because, mm -hmm. they, you know, then their Navy would be at risk, um, their other mm -hmm. assets. Um, but I, it's tough to say because these things have a way of spiraling out of control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think that's right. And I think there's no way, even, even within the Iranian regime, which is notoriously opaque, um, I have very little idea about the actual de decision-making processes that would, that would occur. I would be very, very surprised if they themselves haven't gamed this out in various ways and considered various responses and the various costs and benefits of those responses. But I think at the very least, they would use that moment immediately after a strike just to simply say, well, listen, you used intelligence that you obtained from the IAEA to launch these strikes. Uh, it's information we shared. Um, we're going to pull out of this process. This process is no longer legitimate for us. Um, and you, you've, you know, you've just demonstrated to us why we need a nuclear deterrent. And I think they would have a lot of international support for that, for that position. If not support, then at least sympathy. Yeah. Do you think there's any prospect that Obama, after the election, might strike? He says he's not taking any options off the table. He's even ratcheted up the language a little bit, uh, saying that containment is not an option for him. Or, or he's not his policy, mm -hmm. I forget the exact words. Uh, do you think he means it? Yeah. I think he takes the issue of, of, of non-proliferation very, very seriously. I don't think anyone should doubt mm -hmm. that. So that combined with the engagement with Iran, that Iran you know, be, has, is a major item on his, his foreign policy agenda. Um, whether that means he would strike... You know, I'm really given the 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 you know the resistance to this idea from the military for a number of reasons. Um, it would be a, a very very tough call, even in the best of situations, had we not been involved in two wars for the past ten years. Um, I'm really skeptical that he would. Now, I think that's not the only option. Where I mean, there are other kind of covert options. There's the sabotage options. I think that have been going on for a while. I'm not saying I necessarily support you know, a sort of special forces attack on, on Iranian nuclear installations. But I tend to think that if there were going to be more energetic options on the, you know, military options, I'm kind of curious about, about the, that choice instead of just a, a large scale um, airstrike, you know, a ca airstrike campaign, which would, you know, which, which would take more than days. It would be weeks of strikes to just, you know, to do what we had to do till we could convince ourselves or satisfy ourselves that we'd struck yeah. enough of the installations to, to set the program back, you know, to justify, you know, the total shitstorm that I think would, would sue afterward. Right. I mean, what do you think? Um, I mean, I, I used to think that there was no chance that this president would strike, just because mm -hmm. I did not... The, 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 language, the, the language he was using was so vague, you know, all options on the table, and mm -hmm. he really didn't show any enthusiasm for this. <coughs> I think at this point, he really has um, boxed himself into a corner. I mean, if you say that containment mm -hmm. is not my policy, it's very hard to turn around and then adopt a policy of containment. So um, I, I would not be surprised if he, if he does strike. And I, I, know, I know some very senior people think that, that he will strike after the election, um, you know, and, and he's been surprising in other ways. So, I mean, I certainly don't think the Israelis think that, but I don't know, it's tough to say. You don't think, you don't think he successfully convinced them that he's serious about oh, no, the possibility? Oh, no, definitely not. Um, you know, there was also no. this report that we should mention in Ma'ariv, uh, the Israeli newspaper, saying that Obama had offered... Uh, Netanyahu uh, advanced bunker busting bombs and, and I guess refueling tankers yeah. and, and actually tacit support for a strike if Netanyahu would, would wait until after the election. Um, and I, I would not be at all surprised if that had happened. So I think the smart money yeah. is 
will not go down this year, but I, I think that the chances of the of Israel and or the U.S. allowing Iran to go nuclear without trying to stop it first uh, are, are pretty much close mm -hmm. to zero. And I don't know if you would agree with that. But. Well, I mean, when we need, when we talk about going nuclear, I, you know, ob obtaining a weapon or just getting up to the finish line, because, I mean, that was, you know, that remains a point of disagreement between the Israeli and the American position. So you're saying that they might want to have a, a Canadian option, a, a Japanese option. Right. I mean, I think that's, in my view, that's what the evidence points to right mm -hmm. now, is that they, they are, are kind of, they've got various projects going, you know, they're kind of moving them each along in their own way to kind of get them all one by one up to the finish line, you know, and in, you know, months from now, whenever they get all these things completed, they'll, they'll just kind of stop and be whatever weeks away from, from a, a weapon if they decide that they, that they want to get one. Um, of course, there'll be lots of ways that we can, we'll be able to detect uh, if and when they make that decision. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I think that does offer us, you know, that offers some something of, of a cushion. I mean, it's not it's not a guarantee, but still, I mean, uh, Israel's position, as as articulated by Netanyahu, is that we cannot live with an Iranian nuclear capability. Um, that was a major ask uh, for APAC with this um, with their last conference and their big lobbying day. This um, this resolution that came from Graham and Lieberman, um, you know, asking, you know, trying to move the U.S. red line to where the Israeli red line is on capability versus weapon, mm -hmm. um, and that didn't happen. President Obama, in his speech to APEC, you know, very stressed that he is talking about an Iranian nuclear weapon, not a capability. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was really interesting that even in the speech right before President Obama's. Um, Israeli President Shimon Peres said the same thing. He constantly said Iranian weapon, Iranian nuclear weapon. He did not say capability. Um, so I found that I was, I, you know, I was struck by that level of support by Peres for Obama's position versus uh, Netanyahu. Right. I mean, the Israeli red lines have shifted. Back in 2007, they were talking about the technological mm -hmm. point of no return, and, and, and I think right. there were other points of no mm -hmm. return that we've since crossed. So. Right. Um, I suppose right. it is possible that the red line would shift, but um, you're right. And you know, it's as I'm no, sorry, go ahead. I mean, as a, as a bargaining tactic, it's it's very clever, and you've got to give uh, Netanyahu credit here. Um, you know, this idea that okay, we've waited, we've waited, we've moved our red lines, we've moved our red lines, and that he's made such a big deal about. You know, you know, the danger is growing, and he, he's made it known that he and Barack want to strike, and they really want to do this. So it's almost like every day that Israel does not strike, he so, is sort of presented as a concession right. to the president. Yeah. You know, every day that we don't do this thing that has massive consequences uh, for ourselves and the world, you know, it's kind of, yes, give us credit for not doing this today. Um, I mean, he has incentive to sort of bluster, because that, uh, or at least right now, that's been successful in getting the Europeans and, and the other world players to mm -hmm. implement now the right. sort of crippling sanctions that mm -hmm. we're seeing. Um, right. I think that if we do see a strike later this year, um, you know, the great tragedy will have been these sanctions that they've been implemented a little bit earlier, particularly by the Europeans, it might have actually worked. Um, you know, I guess they, they could still work. We'll see what happens in the talks, but um, I, I think that could end up being the greatest tragedy. Hmm. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really know what to say about that. Um, the, you know, the idea that if, if only we'd done this a year ago or two years ago, I mean, draw that out of it. I, I mean, well, I, I, I think that there was certainly reason... I mean, from the U.S. standpoint, at the very beginning of the Obama administration, we did have a process going, and, and I think they would argue correctly, I think, that the sincere outreach uh, was vital in getting people eventually to agree to the sanctions. Absolutely. Um, but, but we have not had a process since, uh, what, the talks in Istanbul broke up in yeah. January 2010. Right. So I, I don't really see the... A yeah, good reason why this EU oil embargo or the central bank sanctions uh, from the U.S. weren't imposed back then instead of uh, a few months ago. 
And I think it's possible that the regime might be more willing to deal right now if you know, the effects of the sanctions had been uh, more advanced. Yeah. So what do you make of, um, just before we move on to your uh, Iraq piece, um, mm -hmm. I don't know how closely you followed the Iranian parliamentary elections, um, but do you... Oh, not, not at all, Frank. No. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, all right, so then I guess... You I, can say I, I something get... on them. What? I said, you can say something yeah, on them. Well, I mean, my I wrote a piece shortly afterward, just, you know, clearly uh, it seems very clear that the Khamenei's supporters, it was, you know, these are not fair elections, we all know this. They were essentially used as a bit of theater to, to for domestic consumption, but also for international consumption, I think mainly for the former. You know, to show that, you know, Hamene is still the decision maker, he's still in charge, he completely slapped down Ahmadi, Ahmadi, Ahmadinejad. Um, mm -hmm. His, you know, Ahmadinejad's followers were routed. Um, the conservatives and ultra-conservatives in support of Hamene did very, very well. So he's now back in, you know, having faced this sort of upstart challenge from Ahmadinejad's followers and, and the president Ahmadinejad himself, he's now cuffed them, he's back very much unquestioned in his, in his power. So what does this mean for the nuclear talks? I'm not sure. Hamene is known to be very, very suspicious of the possibility of a deal. He seems to be very paranoid. He's convinced everything's a trick, but if he's kind of reestablished and reestablished his own unquestioned supremacy, um, might that, you know, might that, might there be some room now that there's, he's not facing any sort of internal serious challenge for him to give some of his space to, to at least talk, to at least try to find some way to start building trust with, with the West. Uh, I think there's a possibility. I'm not sure. I remain skeptical. But, you know, trying to... Tr I, I think the number one, I think well, one question that we need to ask, um, you know, your talk, and I, I think it's correct uh, in some respect that a strike would certainly help the regime uh, in terms of public opinion mm -hmm. in Iran and would actually give them a pretext to crack down even further mm -hmm. on the opposition. Right. Um, you know, some people like Korean Sajapur say it would, it would resuscitate the regime for a generation. Mm -hmm. So you have to wonder, I mean, is it not then in their interest get bombed? Right, you know, I, I mean, if, if they are... No, I think, I think no, yeah, right, uh, Kareem, I think, said this um, just yesterday in a hearing in the Senate. Um, yeah, I don't think it's their desire. I don't think we'd say that. But, yes, I think clearly they they do see some benefits to a situation like that. I, I think it would, you know, it would obviously go to how 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 much they were, how big a strike it was. Um, but, yeah, I just, yeah. I, I see more and more people, well, not more and more, but there are people who have suggested that, you know, strikes would enable or empower Iranians to rise up against the regime. And I see absolutely no evidence oh, that that's yeah. the case. I mean, I spoke to Jamie Fly uh, here on Foreign Entanglements a few weeks ago about his piece in Foreign Affairs that argued mm -hmm. this. Others have suggested it. And I, just, I, I think it's just fantastical. Yeah, I, I don't see any historical evidence for that. Right. I think it's wishful thinking. All right, on, on that note of agreement, let's move on uh, quickly to just discuss you. Uh, you had an interview with... Um, Iraqi political leader Ayad Alawi. Um, why don't you just yes. kind of describe what you talked to him about? We, we talked about several issues. I don't, I don't think there was anything too surprising. Um, I, I do think it was interesting when he talked about Iran. Uh, Ayad Alawi, of course, was uh, the former prime minister from 2004-2005, uh, secular Shiite. He then, in the past elections, led uh, Iraqia, which was mostly Sunni, and, and I think to most people's surprise, uh, came out ahead of uh, Maliki in, in the vote count, uh, but was not able to form the government just because Maliki had the support of Sadr and, and, and the Kurds. Um, so he's been left sort of outside the fold. He was supposed to get, first he wanted uh, to be president, so they wouldn't give him that, and then he was supposed to head this sort of um, strategic policy council that didn't exist at the time and, and still doesn't really exist. Um, and, and he turned that down when he said that uh, they refused to give it much authority. So you have this weird situation where Iraqia is part of the government, and he really isn't. And, um, you know, so you know, he's essentially a, an opposition leader, in, in a sense. And mm -hmm. he's very bitter. He thinks that the U.S. could have done 
more to support him or to support the process and put more pressure on Maliki. Um, and, and obviously, he's, he's very concerned about the role of Iran in, in Iraqi politics. He told me that Iran had basically swallowed, was the word he mm-hmm. used, had swallowed Iraq since the invasion. And um, it was interesting when uh, he said that a strike on Iran, he was completely against the idea of a strike on Iran by anybody. Um, but at the same time, he called on the U.S. to engage in, and he used the word regime change, uh, by supporting the opposition inside Iran and you know, to support them with, with um, you know, their media, give them um, you know, material support. Um, and you know, he basically said that this was the approach that he recommended in the run-up to the Iraq War. Um, you know, don't just military force, but help the opposition from within. So right. I, I thought that was interesting. No, I did. I found his comments in Iran very interesting, too. Um, I think you did, yeah, you got that's what I heard as well. I mean, talking down strikes, but saying it's kind of a long-term process. Um, I mean, what do you make of what he... he it, well, going back to the Iran swallowing Iraq, I mean, this is something that, I mean, has been clear for a long time. I mean, I think this was, you know, clear very early on in America, you know, in the invasion and occupation, um, the extent to which mm-hmm. Iran was getting into Iraq. And in one way, it should have been very obvious um, you know, they're neighbors, they know Iraq much better than we do. They've had part and they've had relationships with a lot of these players for years and years. Um, including, you know, people like Maliki, who himself took refuge in, in Iran for, for, for a while when he was in exile from Iraq. Parties like this. Including, including the Kurds. The Kurds, exactly. Um, so I have to, you know, I'm almost entertained by the, the extent to which I see a lot of you know, people who supported the war, many conservatives mainly, sort of sounding the alarm on Iranian influence in Iraq when a lot of us who were, who were critics of the occupation were pointing this out years and years ago, and it seems only now, you know, that President Obama has taken over the policy and withdrawn U.S. troops that this, this is a problem. Do you, see, do you see a disconnect there, or, or what do you think? <laughs> Well, I, I just think people didn't think it through before the war. I, I, there was that great Bush moment. I forget whose book it was, yeah. where somebody explains to Bush the difference, you know, that Iraq's partly Sunni, right. partly Shiite, and Bush says, I, I thought they were all Muslim. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, unfortunately, that was the level mm-hmm. of the discourse um, before the invasion. So, you know, I, I don't think um, there was anything unpredictable about this. And um, I mean, I think... Interestingly, you know, talking to Iraqis for, you know, years ago, I mean, as one one Iraqi Shiite, this is an Iraqi Shiite who had considered himself a supporter of Sadr for years and was very, very disenchanted with the Sadrists when I spoke to him, this is 2008, the way he put it is, the the United States has baked Iraq like a cake and given it to Iran to eat. And, you know, it's something I just always remembered. Um, Interestingly, it's, you know, while it's important to note Iran's influence in Iraq, I also think it's important not to overstate it. I think, you know, there is a, a pretty powerful strain of Iraqi nationalism, even among Iraqi Shiites. And, you know, even... even and they, they have been... Oh, go ahead. No, go, go ahead. Uh, it, no, and they have shown some independence, not too mm-hmm. much, uh, on Syria. I think they, they abstain from uh, mm-hmm. the recent General Assembly resolution, whereas Lebanon voted for it, so... But the question is, if, and maybe we can touch briefly on Syria, if Assad does fall, does that not give Iran uh, incentive to sort of double down in Iraq and really try to cultivate that uh, alliance? No, I think, no, that's a good question. I mean, we've got the Arab League meeting in Baghdad for the first time in, I think, two decades. Um, You know, so Iraq kind of, you know, reestablishing its, or just, you know, highlighting its Arab identity. Um, which I, I think is good. I mean, seeing Iraq more more integrated back into that into that world after you know years of hostility and kind of standoffishness by a lot of the leading Arab governments is good. Um, what that you know, and and seeing e- 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 Iraq as a possible point of contact between the Arab world and Iran, I think it also has you know there's positive implications for that as well. Um, but yeah, let's quickly go to, to Syria um, before we finish up. What are your thoughts? 
I, I mean, I think it's clear that you know we don't really have any options, or at least we're not giving ourselves any options. And it seems like there was a little magical thinking uh, on the part of the Washington establishment that, that, that somehow you know Assad would just fold like a house of mm-hmm. cards. And that may still happen, but I, I don't think people thought through the mechanism. And I, I mean, it was very unlikely that you're going to see an Egypt or a Tunisia-like situation play out just because of the sectarian dynamic mm-hmm. here. And, and I think people really didn't appreciate, you know, the very solid uh, base of support. And we can argue whether it was whether it's 20 percent mm-hmm. or 30 percent, but it's clear that he does have a floor of support, yeah. um, you know, just from the Alawites. And, and from the Christians, right. and, and 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 from you know certain other groups. Right. No, and they and they seem pretty. You know, all this fighting and all this international condemnation, as it tends to do in a situation like this, has solidified this very very hard core. I mean, there's they know there's one way out for them, and that's you know eventually yeah. their death. So they're just gonna. They see no reason to stop fighting. It seems. Um, the, the, you know, the, you know, and, and Assad will, I, I think, do what he's continued to do, you know, as with this Assad, this uh, Kofi Annan plan that we saw. Sure, he'll accept it, but he'll keep on doing what he's going to do anyway. Um, well, what do you think of the Annan plan? I, I, I haven't read it in detail. I mean, I know that it, it mm-hmm. you know, offers an Assad a chance to stay in power, which I just, sure, that's a nice idea if we want to end this peacefully, but I, I don't think any of the parties in Syria see this ending peacefully. Mm-hmm. Does that sound right to you? But well, uh, well I, I was just a little puzzled. I, I don't know whether Anand himself views this as a, as a transitional plan, yeah. or whether he really does think that there is a final solution here where Assad could remain in power. Yeah. Uh, I think that if that is his view, then he's done a, a great disservice to everyone right. uh, in sort of you know making it seem like we were reaching an international consensus that Assad had right. to go. Yeah, and so I, I can't but think that this is unhelpful. Right. Yeah, no, that's my, my my take as well. I mean, you know, it's, I mean, going back over the last year, you know, year more, more than a year as as we've been discussing this, um, I think it's about a year, um, you know, since since uh, the Syria revolution or the uprising kicked off. You know, it, it's amazing. It's, it's just one of those things that, you know, and we thought we had kind of talked through this R2P, this responsibility to protect. We see how complicated that is. Um, you know, it's yet, yet another one of these situations that sort of demonstrates <laughs> the inability of of people to really do anything. We're all kind of stuck here on the sidelines. You've got Turkey, I think, which has done some impressive things and shown, you know, on, on, on the margins, but still everybody's kind of standing around looking at each other going, okay, how do we end this? Yeah, you, you know, you first. Yeah, it's, right. It's, uh, the you first problem, right. so, uh, I, you know, I think, the administration, if, if Turkey and Saudi Arabia were willing to take a lead, they might be willing to be more um, engaged. But and unfortunately, I think we're, we're in for more of the same for at least at least several more months. Mm-hmm. All right. On that, um, um, do you want to? On that uh, optimistic note, I think we we can we finish up. Uh, thanks a lot, Ben. It was great talking to you. Thanks, Matt. All right. Talk to you again soon. Talk to you again soon. Bye bye.